Hello from Ethiopia. So good morning, afternoon, and evening, excellencies, distinguished guests, both in the room and those joining remotely. Uh, before I begin, I just would like to mention that we have interpretation available into French and Spanish, and we will be using the main camera uh, in the room as one unmute camera. So hopefully it's at the top of your screen. You can always pin that if you like for those who are joining remotely. Uh, my name is Daniel Perel, and on behalf of the Baha'i International Community, I would like to welcome you all to this hybrid event. Uh, while creating spaces like this requires a bit more of an investment, the small challenges we face in trying to be more inclusive are worth the effort in order to ensure civil society participation online and in person, whether it be in our office, but more importantly for today's meeting at the United Nations. Civil society can serve as the leaven, enabling many advances at the local, national, and global levels. Prior to explaining some of the logistics for this meeting, I would just like to extend my gratitude to those who established and are working with the Unmute Civil Society Coalition. It has great potential to ensure that new models of partnership, collaboration, and learning commensurate with the needs of this moment in human history can emerge sooner rather than later. Different social actors must no longer be competing against each other, giving rise to a cycle of adversarialism, uh, but rather recognize that our challenges are shared and our contributions diverse. With inclusive and effective mediums of communication, this reality will become ever clearer and our contributions uh, and action ever easier. So today we have about 20 individuals joining in person. We will have two cameras in the room. Uh, one will be focused on the speaker, that's this one, hello everybody, uh, while the other up there will show the whole room. Uh, so please do forgive the slight delay as the mobile camera makes its way from speaker to speaker. We're, we're still learning about all of these things as well. Um, and it would be wonderful for those in the room if you'd like to join the Zoom call as well uh, in order to chat with and be seen by those unable to join in person. Uh, but if you do connect here, please mute your microphone and disable your sound to avoid a feedback loop. Uh, we will be recording this event and photos will be taken. Finally, it almost goes without saying at this point, uh, please do keep yourselves on mute during this event, even though it is an unmute event, it's not to be taken literally. Um, and with that, I have the, the distinct pleasure to hand the floor over to Mandeep Tiwana from Civicus, the Global Civil Society Alliance. Mandeep, you have the floor. Thank you, Dan. And warm welcome to everybody who's joining us here and also to the eminent personalities who joined us here and for your support for civil society. We appreciate it very much. Today's event, as Dan, you mentioned, is Unmute Civil Society. So it's, it's, a, it's a program of action. It's a campaign that we have been undertaking along with several civil society organizations to open up the space for our work at the UN and beyond. Uh, I'm Mandeep Tiwana, and I'll be your facilitator for the day. I'm representing Civicus, the Global Civil Society Alliance, and I will be assisted by colleagues here. But first of all, let me thank the governments of Denmark and Costa Rica for co-hosting this event, for supporting civil society in taking our work forward. And we are also joined today by representatives from Finland, from Denmark, uh, and, uh, and also from UN Women. And thank you for your support. And from Mexico, uh, that very much. So we have a really packed agenda and we have uh, a very sh a short time to make all the presentations and I'm going to be uh, stewarding you all through, through this. But first, a little bit about the Unmute campaign. The campaign really seeks to maximize opportunities for information communication tools, to harness the power of technology to ensure better participation of civil society, and more importantly, to ensure that civil society is able to practice participate in UN meetings and processes, but we also recognize that there are digital divides around the world and everybody cannot participate at the same level due to inequities in access. So it also looks at supporting access so that we can have more equal participation of civil society and work. But more importantly, and uh, the campaign also seeks to ensure meaningful civil society participation. That is looking at how civil society can participate in interactive sessions with the UN, and also importantly to see how we can look at the processes and modalities, how those can be reformed, how those can be made better, so that the voices of the people are brought into important discussions that are being carried out at the UN. 
We are also calling for an annual civil society day, either on the March UN General Assembly or on the March of the high level political forum uh, through, through this campaign. And importantly, we are calling for a creation of a high level civil society envoy at the UN. This high level envoy can help streamline civil society processes, can help streamline civil society participation at the UN and open up the UN's processes and make them more even and more equitable for civil society participation. So without uh, further ado, let, let, let me hand over our first presentation to uh, Mr. Fleming Muller Mortensen, Minister for Development Cooperation of Denmark. Thank you very much for your support for civil society. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Secretary General, Assistant Secretary General, Excellences, distinguished panelists and guests. This is a very important meeting. I'm delighted to kickstart this dialogue on uh, taking forward the UN Mute recommendations. And I'm equally pleased to co host today's event with His Excellences Ambassador Christian from the Costa Rica. I'm pleased to be here together with you. Me too. Today's dialogue is important. How to create a large such space for meaningful civil society participation, online and in person, now and beyond the pandemic. Digital technologies hold great potential. They can help broadening civic engagement in democratic processes, and they can provide a stronger voice to the vulnerable and marginalized. They can bring people together and bring all, us all closer to the decisions that have an impact on our lives. That said, the digital uh, divide and lack of online access pose a challenge to the participation of the uh, civil society in uh, the virtual processes and activities, such as those held at the UN Nations. This reinforce the global trends of lacking respect for human rights and shrinking civic space, both offline and online, that we unfortunately are witnessing. The pandemic has only worsened these trends. Denmark recognizes and fully supports the crucial role that civil society plays in achieving the sustainable development goals and reaching a more inclusive world as we build back better from the pandemic. We need to protect, promote, and allow civil society to participate in a meaningful way because we know that inclusive processes lead to results in better and better outcomes. Together, with good colleagues from Costa Rica and civil society organizations, we are delighted to have brought forward concrete recommendations to you and mute civil society. There's an urgent need for ensuring that nobody is muted, excluded, or sidelined. Denmark stands strong with partners and civil society in ensuring that no one and no voice is left behind. We must continue working together to deliver on this promise. Now more than ever, we need to stand up for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. It is virtual. It's vital that we uh, cooperate to ensure a responsible, secure, and democratic technology future. Denmark is ready to do its part. One example of our uh, is our Tech to Democracy initiative. It seeks to bring states, tech industry representatives, multilateral organizations, and civil society organizations together to find joint solutions and make digital technology support dem democracy and uh, dem democracy and, and human rights. This, it's, it, this it includes protecting civic space online and promoting civic enge engagement in demo democratic processes. It includes using digital technologies to enhance the, the digital resilience of 
civil society. The initiative aims to involve the tech industries to seek ways of carrying forward the recommendations to you and mute civil society dialogue that Denmark and Costa Rica handed over to the UN Secretary General in May this year. Civil society needs to be unmuted in order to be included. I hope we can use this platform today to have an open discussion, share experiences, and discuss our next steps and share uh, commitments in this space. With this, I look forward to hearing from all of you uh, in your inspiring speakers and, and, and talks. Uh, this is what I'm going to say now. I really thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Watson, for that inspiring speech. No one should be muted or excluded. And uh, that, is, that is a really important uh, message that I think we need to take forward and how through technology we can make space for those who are excluded, those who are vulnerable, those who are marginalized. I'm now going to hand over the floor to, to Mr. Christian Guilherme Fernandez, the Vice Minister for Multilateral Affairs with Costa Rica. Thank you very much for your support for civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and let me start saying that it's always a pleasure to come in a space where you know that you're going to find only friends. If I don't meet all of you, I feel like uh, I'm going to have uh, uh, new friends here. And this is something wonderful to start a day. Dear Fleming, my new friend, <laughs> Asa, Mandip, uh, uh, my colleague from Mexico, uh, uh, and all the high representatives and Mem from the member states, representative for international organizations and civil society. Um, it's with a great pleasure and enthusiasm that I um, deliver on behalf of Costa Rica these opening remarks with the aim of keeping this momentum, the momentum that started already one year ago with the first UN Mute event, but also to show upfront and without hesitation our highest support to the contributions that civil society made to our work as states and as the United Nations. The civil society represents much more than a partner in decision-making and implementations. They are the ears and eyes of the ground, the watchdogs of public and private action, and ultimately architects of the future they demand. Since the creation of United Nations civil society organizations have been in our tape, bringing ideas, correcting mistakes with more and less visibility, with more or less voice, with more or less entitlement. But they have always been challenging the United Nations and member states to be our best face and to place human rights and global commons at the center of decision-making and program. Costa Rica, as Denmark, believes it is now time for governments to recognize that we haven't sent the good table for them and to demonstrate commitment to this issue. COVID-19 has made clear that no challenge faced by the, our human family can overcome without the participation of all actors not the least civil society. Progress will be constrained in rolling out the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement on Human Rights, if local and international civil society organizations are not involved directly, including organizations for women, girls, and scholars. Civil society, including academia, can, for instance, help to advance the 2030 agenda simply by bolstering the case for science. However, However, civil space around the world remains highly constrained. Civicus monitor statistics reveal that 87% of the world's populations live in countries with adverse civic space conditions. The absence of civil space robs the ability of most people to shape the decisions that impact their lives and undermines progress in Agenda 2030 commitments. The United Nations can and should live up to these aspirations. Participatory democracy must be the cornerstone 
of UN efforts towards a future network and inclusive multilateralism where different actors and constituencies play a greater role in delivering global public goods. goods. This will in turn contribute to rebuild trust between people and government, beginning with the United Nations. Costa Rica strongly believes that the UN has a space for improving its linkage with civil society organizations, creating opportunities for them to engage in meaningful consultations processes and formalizing their engagement through a system-wide approach across pillars and organs. This is the way we did not hesitate in engaging with the government of Denmark and civil society organizations themselves to produce a paper with concrete recommendations that could help spur of our common efforts, supported Secretary General leadership, particularly under the call for action for human rights, and to demonstrate political will and commitment, and commitment for the benefit of civil space. The recommendation, which includes the maximization of the advantages of ICTs to make the UN while addressing digital gaps in access and use, ensuring timely access to information regarding decision-making process at the UN and adopting a system-wide approach to the attention of partnerships, for instance, through the creation of a special envoy for civil society, as long as standing demand by civil society. I think this is, must be our goal. And I hope that next year, I'm gonna meet with my new friends again, and we can celebrate this achievement. Costa Rica will continue in uh, its own efforts with Denmark and with all those friends. And believe at this time that member states join hands and speak upfront for civil space. It is crucial that the UN respond to the new generations who are engaging and working on issues of social justice and equality. The UN must encourage and facilitate partnership between youth, civil society, and multilateral systems to create a space that reflects the world that we know today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Minister. You are referencing of the watchdog role of civil society, which is the reason why civic space often gets threatened is a really important point. And also, thank you for your support for the Special Envoy for Civil Society. The Secretary General's a Common Agenda Report uh, recognizes that, that call for civil society, but we have work to do to make it a reality. Yes. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Asa Regna from uh, UN Women. Asa, you'll be talking to us about the work of UN Women in protecting civic space, but also about feminist action uh, work that has been taking place in various coalition platforms. Thank you so much, uh, Mandeep, Civicus, everybody here, Denmark, Costa Rica, Mexico, uh, and also Finland who have come back to because we've been working very closely together on. Um, some initiatives recently, which are in, uh, relevant to what we're talking about. And most of all, hello, good morning, good afternoon, evening to every, all the friends um, here with us representing civil society. Um, when you work with feminist issues and gender equality in the world, you are very aware that almost no progress, to be honest, uh, would be possible without the push and the pressure and the monitoring of civil society and feminist organizations, youth organizations, LGBT organizations and others who we interact with uh, almost daily. And as you, we all know, we have at least 18 months behind us where we've been doing online um, dialogues and sessions uh, almost exclusively. Uh, that has meant a lot of uh, both um, challenges and possibilities for all of us. I see now that we're moving into more of a hybrid version of, of uh, interaction, and I, I suppose we will stay that way for quite some time, maybe forever, who knows. Uh, the online interaction in, in around policy making, pol political decisions, and so on, and advocacy from the side of civil society means obviously enormous uh, possibilities because you can connect, and we have seen that in a way we that wasn't possible before. Fridays for Future or Me Too or other movements uh, would pro probably not have been possible without this, these hybrid uh, uh, tools or, and, and possibilities to interact. But we also know, and I want to 
point that out, although this is about opportunities, but that it also means a lot of uh, risks of threats and online harassment and so on, which I know is a daily, uh, daily risk for uh, those of you advocating for girls and women's rights. And unfortunately, we see that these threats and intimidations are unfortunately increasing rather than decreasing in the world. So we feel a lot of responsibility to support you in both the possibilities and the challenges and to understand those. I also wanted to say that uh, online uh, interaction when it comes to feminist action is extremely important. But just to remember, uh, I visited a meeting uh, in the framework of the so-called least developed countries not uh, long ago. And women in these countries, uh, actually only 15% of women in those countries have access to internet. Uh, for men, it's double that figure, which is also very low <laughs> compared to uh, my home country, which is Sweden, uh, and, and they're uh, an average in the world. So I just wanted to also have that with us uh, when, we, when we talk about the future and the responsibilities for all of us to make these online connections uh, possible. To now move into uh, what we, we are working on and to not take up too much time, uh, I, we just now came out this year uh, out of two important events, I think. We first had the Commission on the Status of Women, which, as you know, is the UN's second largest meeting every year after the General Assembly. And we normally gather about 30, 40,000 people in this building. But these last two years, the first year we had to cancel, which was traumatic, but this is not a therapy session for me. This is to discuss <laughs> how we can instead have these important meetings because the, uh, the participation of civil society is absolutely crucial for uh, the Commission on the Status of Women. So this year we had to do it online. And when we, we had the feedback, uh, we, we tried to organize it together with civil society to, to find the best ways of their access to the meetings and discussions. And when we spoke to civil society afterwards, some were very critical. They felt they could not participate. And others thought, yes, this was the first time I could participate since it, it didn't require tickets to go to New York. So I think we need to learn from all of these uh, interactions. The topic that year was women's participation in public and political life in decision making. So I mean, the topic was extremely uh, uh, relevant to what we are talking about. And we really have to learn. Um, we also in July uh, had the uh, Generation Equality Forum in uh, Paris. And before that, we had had a, a, the, the reflective event in Mexico uh, on generation equality, which many of you know is an um, um, uh, initiative to close the gap between political engagement on a rhetoric level with the slow changes we have seen in reality when it comes to women's and girls' rights. Uh, we had in that uh, framework six action coalitions for specific action, and one of them uh, was on uh, uh, ICT, on online solutions and, and uh, online democracy when it comes to feminist participation and gender equality. Uh, and Finland was one of the leaders in that and also did very ambitious work in their home country to uh, really try to, to be a pilot uh, on this. And we had really good uh, discussions and conclusions coming out of that. So I want to thank uh, Finland for that and Mexico, of course, and also Denmark, who was part of the uh, uh, other work uh, in, in this endeavor. And we had to do all of this again as hybrids, mostly online. And uh, wow. it's also something for us to learn from. But we, we had success in terms of engagement, also financial one. So uh, uh, we are happy about that. But now we have to work with you. My last point is on the upcoming Commission on the Status of Women, because there we will have new working methods as one of the topics. New working methods really in reality means how can we engage uh, or make possible engagement from civil society together with member states in these intergovernmental processes. Generation equality was another kind of process. How can we open the doors even more? We need decisions in the intergovernmental processes on that, which is very difficult nowadays. 
but we believe that the component of uh, internet and online participation will be very important in, in that. This, the uh, other topic is climate change and gender equality. Lots of uh, activists know a lot about that, not least young people. So we are going to prepare those two topics together with you very closely. I can feel steps coming towards me now. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much. I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much for that comprehensive overview and also for highlighting the, how the women's movement and the work of UN Women has helped highlight important challenges that the world is facing, including on climate justice and also for defending civic space, but also the challenges that are still there through online uh, uh, violence that takes place against women activists. Thank you very much for that. Uh, before I hand over to our next speaker, we have uh, tried to make this uh, interactive, this session interactive. So Sarah Brown from Global Focus, who's been a key player in setting up this, uh, th th this side event, is just going to share with us a Slido deck, uh, which, which allows our participants to, put, to, part, uh, to take part online. Thank you, Mandeep. Yes, I just wanted to uh, quickly highlight that we do have a Slido set up that we encourage all of you to take part in online. You can see the website and the password here on the slide. We will also post it in the chat again. And the questions are, how inclusive have you found the online processes at UN meetings you have attended in the past year? And then what are the greatest barriers to meaningful civil society participation in the UN system? And lastly, we ask you to kindly share any good practices of civil society participation that could be more widely adopted. Please do join this dialogue. And um, my daughter is here in the background, which obviously is what we all face when we do virtual meetings. But um, I think I'll hand over the mic now, sorry. <laughs> Amazing sound. So, uh, thank you very much for taking us through this. Our, our next speaker is uh, is uh, Mr. Pe Mr. Pekka Havisto, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Finland. Thank you very much for joining us. Today. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and, and great to be online with you. And, and thanking, of course. Uh, both Costa Rica and Denmark for hosting this and arranging this round table. And I think this is a very good break for all those bilateral and other meetings during this UN week here in, in uh, New York. And of course, from the Finnish perspective and from our point of view, both UN and, and our respective countries we benefit of the active role and, and even critical role of the civil society as part of the democracy. And, and that role has to be respected in all democrat democracies. And uh, yesterday, I actually had a very good discussion with the UN Youth Envoy, and, and her role is, of course, very crucial to, to get also the voice of the young people in the UN system and get, get more young people to get engaged. And I, I had the pleasure to inform that Finland is probably the first country having now the national program on the youth, peace and security, the UN 250, and, and uh, we hope that other countries will follow this model to get youth engaged also to the I would say to the hard questions of uh, uh, peace and security and, and, and having that debate nationally and internationally. And uh, uh, we also discussed actually with the UN Youth Envoy about the youth participation in the coming COP26 in Glasgow. We have in Finland a tradition that uh, we have a, a youth and, and NGO representatives in our official delegations when participating, for example, the climate talks and, and again, I know that many countries have the similar model, but it's very important that these young people can then interlink among themselves prior to the COP26 and probably after that and, and, and so forth. It's also very important that we, we uh, try to engage with the, the uh, human rights defenders as much as we can. I just tell you an example that when Finland was the uh, at the presidency of European Union 2019, we invited the uh, uh, human rights defenders to meet the ministers. And, and it was a very lovely moment because some of the human rights defenders from, from uh, other countries said that they had never met in their own minister in their own country. And now they meet yeah. 27 ministers at the same time <laughs> trying to explain about their activities and, and so forth. And, and I, I think it was uh, a meeting that, that many of the ministers remember remember very, very well for them and their life. 
the role of women uh, also was raised particularly now, but with the, by the UN women representative. And thank you for what you said about that. And also the, the, the role of Finland. We are also looking the, the role of women in, in the peace and security issues according to the UN 1325. And, and I think it's very important that that will be done. Also here in the discussion, it was raised that during the COVID-19, we have had a lot of challenges of participation. We, we know now more about the digital participation, but we also have learned more about the digital divide that all of people do not have that luxury of, of uh, being online and participating online. And also the issue of the safe space was, was raised up that how to make then the digital participation safe for each and each and everyone. And I think the generation equality discussions and others were also very important from, from that perspective. And Finland was happy, of course, to participate that very important event that was, was organized. Um, we have uh, now our candidature from Finland to, to the uh, UN Human Rights Council and, and the role of the young people, role of the human rights defenders, role of the women, uh, indigenous groups, minorities, people with disabilities are, are very much in our scope also in our campaign for the UN Human Rights Council. And if we be elected, of course, these are the voices that we want to hear also in the, in the UN Human Rights context. Maybe finally, I want to tell a story Fridays for Future have been mentioned, and we had our national election spring uh, 2019, and, and all the young people on Fridays were surrounding the parliament house and, you know, stopping the parliamentarians. And, uh, and these people had a lot of influence, actually, to our government program, that the uh, environmental and climate issues were taken so seriously by all the political parties in Finland. And I, I always remember when I stop some of these young people and asking them, what are your teachers saying that you are here every Friday and you are not in school? And then they told that, you know, in the classroom, they said, you shouldn't be away from the school, but behind the corner they are. I mean, it comes up that it's, it's so good that young people are active. And I, th I think this is also when we look at the future, it's, it's we benefit from those young people who are already now active on these important global issues. Thank you, I will finish here. Thank you, Minister Havasto, and thank you for referencing the importance of civil society in supporting democracy and about youth participation. And importantly, also, wish you all the best for your election for the Human Rights Council. It is a real gripe for civil society that some of the members of the Human Rights Council don't always adhere and uphold the human rights values. But, you know, so, uh, our next speaker is from Mexico. And Thank you uh, very much for being here, Deputy Prime Minister Representative uh, Alice, Al Alicia Bonestero. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, I have to get your full name right, so please apologies. No worries at all. Alicia Buenostro Masio, Deputy Prime Minister Representative of Mexico. Uh, the floor is all yours now. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we're very happy to be here this morning and representing my country. Um, really honored because we think this is a very timely event on the benefits of civil society participation at the UN. We have already heard very good ideas from the ministers of uh, Denmark and, uh, and Finland and also from the Vice Minister of Costa Rica. And uh, Mexico has always been, uh, and more than always, I would say that for the past 30 years, 40 years, we've been very active supporting um, NGO civil society participation at the United Nations. And we think this is a very important thing. We know that civil society organizations have proven to be invaluable stakeholders in democratic public life throughout the world. And this is absolutely uh, uh, true. And we continue to witness as well how including civil society in public policy conversations enriches the quality of government's action at all levels. So these organizations bring expertise social proximity and creativity to the decision-making process. And so what can I say, but indeed governments do not have a monopoly on good ideas. So this is especially evident in the multilateral sphere. Uh, a natural evolution of the United Nations system is to hedge towards a more inclusive multilateralism. This is outlined in the recent common agenda report of the Secretary General. And while the nature of our organization remains very much an intergovernmental one, and its decisions are made by member states, this should not preclude at all 
that stakeholders, stakeholders from providing their expert input. As an example, we can refer, and we have heard that as well, to the valuable collaboration of civil society organizations in the definition of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And thanks to civil society, we have people sent, we have a people-centered roadmap for recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is quite important. Mexico has also supported and will continue to support civil society participation at the UN. When possible, we have integrated civil society representatives in our official delegations. In addition, we promote a transparent and inclusive process to grant consultative status to NGOs as a member of the Committee on NGOs. And most recently, Mexico endorsed the series of recommendations for consideration of the Secretary General to ensure meaningful civil society participation at the UN. So I want to thank again the governments of Costa Rica and Denmark, as well as the multiple NGOs involved for putting concrete proposals on the table, and we will be very happy to follow up on that. I would just like to end saying that Mexico right now is a non-permanent member of the Security Council, and that along with Ireland, we are um, co-chairs of the expert groups of the informal expert group on women, peace, and security. And it is, we have already agreed, and that is our commitment, you know, to have many women uh, as briefers as possible in all the events during the month of November when Mexico will be presiding over the presidency of the Security Council. And of course, to bring um, everybody who is an expert and who can make a difference in, as a briefer at, uh, at the UN Security Council during that month. And this is for, this is, a, we have a tripartite commitment from Ireland, Kenya, and Mexico to do exactly the same thing. Ireland is, all, is right now the president of the Security Council. They have included many women, I think as, as many as we have seen before, as briefers in all, the, in all their events during the month of September. And we look forward to doing the same during the months of October and November. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for referencing the important role of civil society in policy making and also for the commitment to include civil society in official delegations. This is a long standing demand of civil society to be part of official delegations and to help show that all country reports are then taking a comprehensive perspective. So Absolutely. We appreciate yeah. that and look forward to your presidency of the Security Council. As you know, civil society organizations help uncover information about violations of rights which happen in conflict and Absolutely. Are major threats. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the contrary. Our next speaker is go is now online and we will be moving to uh, Christina Kulias from the Global Compact. Uh, over to you, Christina. Thanks so much, Mandeep. Um, excellencies, colleagues and friends, I'm delighted to be with you today and thank the organizers for this opportunity. I'm going to speak briefly and generally to the role of the business community in respecting and supporting the civic space and stress that business must respect and support efforts to preserve it. If we look at reports from organisations, including Civicus, the Committee to Protect Journalists, Global Witness and others, there are increasing accounts of the role of business in causing and contributing to rights violations whether this is through authorised land acquisition without the informed consent of Indigenous communities or abusing the power of technology to suppress public participation. Target 10 of SDG 16 seeks to ensure public access to information and the protection of fundamental freedoms in accordance with national legislation and international agreements. And to be sure at the heart of this target is the call for state and non-state actors to respect and support the civic space, which comprises of journalists, environmental and human rights defenders, trade unionists and others who serve as critical sources in identifying corruption, disinformation, environmental degradation and human and labour rights violations. And to be sure, business invested in the security and stability of the civic space as it serves as a um, a clarion call or a canary in the coal mine, if you will, to um, any abuses. 
Business can and must pay special attention to the Civic or the shared space, a publication commissioned by the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre and the International Service for Human Rights, which is titled Shared Space Under Pressure, Business Support for Civic Freedoms and Human Rights Defenders, guides businesses in understanding what role they can play to respect and support accountable governance, rule of law, and civic freedoms, and ultimately contribute to the achievement of Target 1610. The UN Global Compact's own SDG 16 business framework provides guidance to businesses on each of the targets under SDG 16, including Target 1610. It inspires businesses to embrace transformational approach to governance, that includes not only robust corporate governance, but also stronger environmental and social protections and supporting efforts to create more inclusive institutions, laws and systems as a complement and not a substitute for government action. To be sure, the role of the UN in serving as a beacon towards greater global cooperation through inclusive multilateralism is critical in setting the standard to ensure the voice of civil society is heard and it sets the tone for all actors, state and non-state, to respect and support these voices as we work together to address the most pressing challenges. This is especially important as we see so many of these voices being suppressed in many parts of the world. We look forward to continuing the conversation on how business can support efforts to strengthen the voice of civil society within the UN and within public and private institutions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Christina. As you can see, that was music to our ears. That <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> this is going to use its influence to protect democratic values and speak out <laughs> for those activists who are under threat and uh, and to speak truth to power. So, welcome to the club. Thank you. Uh, we are now going to move to uh, the, the civil society segment, and uh, we have a number of eminent civil society activists from around the world who are going to be. Uh, sharing, their, sharing their views on what practical steps the UN and governments can take to enhance civil society space at the UN and beyond. So our first speaker needs no introduction. She's Julia Sanchez, who's the Secretary General of ActionAid International. Over to you, Julia. Thank you so much, uh, Mandeep, and uh, good afternoon, uh, good, good evening, good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, in, this, uh, in this space. As many said, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, refreshing to be in a space where there's a lot of connection and like-mindedness, but it's also a little dangerous because we know that outside there's still so much uh, difficulty uh, with accepting and engaging with the issue of the need for greater uh, civic space and to protect civic space, but uh, great to be here with all of you. Um, I was going to just very quickly highlight some of the things first that that have been mentioned um, by others as to what you know what we're concerned about uh, from Action Aid, and and by the way, I'm also the chair of Civicus, so very much following uh, this issue through the great work that Civicus does. Um, but you know the, the the attacks on frontline activists and human rights defenders, as some of you have alluded to, is continuing. It's increasing, and so the the space, the civic space, continues to shrink despite um, you know some commitments from many of you in in this room and others to to addressing this issue. So that is concerning us uh, enormously. Um, we see increased attention of protesters and excessive use of force against them across the world, including uh, in Canada, where I'm uh, originally from. Usually I'm, I am there. I'm not there uh, today. Um, and so that is, you know, excessively worrying. As ActionAid, um, we are quite a, a progressive, bold uh, organization in, in the sector. And over the last 12 months, I believe we've had four of our chairs of our national boards, national action aids, put in prison for a trumped up charges um, in the context of democratic transitions or other processes. So it, it's very, very alarming. And the pandemic, of course, has served as a perfect excuse to restrict democratic activities uh, even more. And this is something that we're watching and concerned with um, and linked to the issue around disinformation, manipulation uh, of information, reduced access to in sources of information uh, is quite tied to that um, COVID environment. So what practical steps do we think um, 
uh, can be undertaken. I'm going to uh, divide my quick comments into two groups. First, governments, uh, steps that governments uh, can take, and then uh, the UN um, as, as a multilateral body. So I want to emphasize again the need to protect civil society and human rights defenders from reprisals and shrinking uh, civic space. Um, you know, there is, of course, uh, and some of you have alluded to, to it, a um, uh, representative from Mexico talked about it and others of the importance of uh, bringing civil society um, voices when we're crafting solutions to the great challenges that we face uh, as humanity. But there's also this, this need to make sure that uh, there are civil society voices uh, in the room that are reminding us constantly because of the work that they do on the ground of the, the fate of uh, so many human rights defenders across the world, women rights defenders, lands rights defenders, indigenous rights defenders. Um, it really is journalists, of course, was mentioned um, uh, quite alarming. So I think it's also incumbent on us as civil society to make sure that we're there speaking to that and shining a light uh, to, to those issues. At ActionAid, we've committed to shift our focus um, towards being more uh, an organization that facilitates, supports, and enables social movements to do, to change the world. And those social movements are led by precisely these people that are under, under threat. So we feel it's our responsibility to be shining a light on that. Uh, so member states um, also need to consider uh, increasing the representation of civil society in their countries and democratic processes and that that be reflected in multilateral bodies. So many of you have spoken some initiatives that you are taking and we applaud. And again, we're, we're with, with a group of people who are taking, um, who are ahead of the game and, and uh, taking initiatives in this regard. Um, I wanna mention one and acknowledge the Danish government that is represented in the room. Um, uh, we feel you led by example recently by providing space to civil society in key UN spaces uh, this year, including uh, voices of civil society and activists uh, when uh, Denmark uh, produced its voluntary uh, national review, presented its um, Danish voluntary national review. So that is the kind of example that can inspire hopefully others and we need to make sure that others who are not yet uh, going in that direction um, are, are encouraged to do so. Um, the other uh, point I would mention is around uh, information and access to information. So state surveillance of data collection activities during COVID, this has taken another, uh, another uh, dimension and something that you know, we're worried about. So states and governments need to guarantee online freedom of expression while safeguarding rights to accurate information, privacy and security, and to enable reliable and unfettered access to internet um, to their populations. Um, what, multi what we could see in the multilateral space, of course, we have been advocating um, as, as Civicus and as ActionAid and, and, and you know, hundreds of civil society groups for this special envoy for civil society. Um, the, I think it was the Danish uh, representative uh, just now spoke about, or was it the Finnish, probably it was the Finnish, spoke about their positive experience uh, meeting the, the youth uh, envoy. And that is a great example, uh, but we need to do more. Uh, and um, we really hope uh, that this recommendation, this very concrete recommendation will uh, see the light of day sooner rather than later. Um, we're disappointed that um, in, the, in the report that came out our common agenda uh, from the UN Secretary General, this was not given more priority and, and we do hope that this will be uh, accelerated. Uh, finally, around um, uh, meaningful participation, Yes, of civil society groups uh, that are involved and engaged with key issues around, uh, you know, uh, our common agendas and and UN uh, UN uh, priorities, but also to ensure that that meaningful participation includes frontline activists, not just a formal civil society groups, and that we're we're working and it's not easy, uh, and we need to work together uh, to make sure that the that the voices of those front frontline activists that are under attack are heard in these multilateral spaces. So thank you very much for this opportunity again. Thank you, Riva, for this report. Our next speaker is Carmen Capriles from Reaxon Climatica in Bolivia. Uh, Carmen, I am mindful that there are uh, four of us uh, who still need to speak from civil society. So if you can keep your comments to two minutes, that would be great. Yes. Thank you very much. 
Uh, first, I want to speak as uh, an activist that comes from a developing country as it is Bolivia. Uh, it is really hard for uh, people living in the South to break a number of barriers to make our voices be heard. And therefore, these spaces within UN are very, very important to start tackling some of the issues that, that are systemic. Therefore, we, we really hope that this space of civil society within UN is not closed. And we, want, uh, we don't want that the pandemic becomes an excuse to let a number of people that cannot access vaccines, that cannot access uh, uh, a number of, 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 of issues because of our situation to access these spaces where we can advocate and where we can make our voices be heard. Uh, second, I want to share a good practice, which is from the women's uh, major group. Well, the major groups within uh, UNEA, the United Nations Environmental Assembly, uh, the process of the consultations uh, uh, for the regional processes with the ministers of environment and with the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, environmental assembly. It is a process that is bottom up, that we're trying to give it a shape, taking into account our regional differences, our regional common agendas, and try to push for uh, environmental measures that we hope they are taking into account, they, are, they can be heard in the case of environment. And third, uh, I think it's important around the defenders that we have, uh, we take into account that it's not only the, the, the the killing that we want to avoid. That's kind of like the, 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 the last step that um, the system take, takes to eliminate uh, environmental defenders or human rights defenders. And uh, with the hundred uh, uh, voices that have been shot, that have been killed in the last year, um, that were fighting for environment, that were fighting for human rights, we have thousands of voices that are still shout because there are totalitarian governments, because extractivism is growing, because inequality is growing, and the pandemic is becoming also an excuse to share up these voices. So that's why it's important to have these spaces to talk about the defenders, to talk about what's going on in the front lines, to talk about what this fight is for, and it's for nature, it's for environment, it's for uh, the basic things that probably do not have a price on Wall Street, but are still important because those ecosystems that are being destroyed, like the Amazon that's burning, uh, they are the ones that are going to give us the, the, the healthy environment that we want and the natural services that we need. So I think it's something to take into account and to conclude, uh, I think it's important to take in, to, to recognize the big step that Latin America has taken in order to approve the ESCASO agreement to promote access to information, access to justice, and access to uh, participation, uh, and to take into account the vulnerable groups and the defenders. And we hope that in the next year, when we have the first COP, we have not only the 11 countries that have already ratified the ESCASO agreement, but, but more. Among them, there is Costa Rica, so it's an invitation and we hope that this process can really uh, change the balance again. Thank you very much. And, and, and also, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, new, I'm totally new to this. Um, this is my first time um, addressing, um, I, I believe it's the United Nations, um, and uh, civil society uh, organizations. Uh, my name is Kathleen. Um, um, and we, have very, we have very short period of time. If you would just type your yes. comments on, in the chat, we can certainly read them out and take them into account. Would that be okay? Because we have another speaker in Becky Mele from the Philippine Rural Reconstruction Movement and, and the Coalition for the UN We Need who is due to speak. So if we were to give you space, then we would have to take away her space. So kindly bear with us and just do type your comments there and I will read them out. Over to you, Becky. Thank you, Mandeep. Sorry, it took time for me to unmute. 
Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak in this very important event. Thank you to the governments of uh, Denmark, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Finland, and the UN Women for supporting civil society calls for greater participation in the, at the United Nations. Uh, the Asia Pacific region where I come from was the first to establish the first CSO engagement mechanism on the SDGs. As a prelude to the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development that uh, happens in March in Bangkok, we as SEO, uh, CSO since 2015 had our own two-day forum taking stock of the issues that were crucial to the progress of the SDGs. We were clear about our framework and our participation and engagement, and we achieved unity in our analysis of the situation surrounding Agenda 20. 2030. While we continue to point out the systemic issues and the barriers that would hinder the fulfillment of the SDGs and Agenda 2030, we also want to share our best practices. So uh, I'm very happy now that the major groups and other stakeholders coordinating mechanisms at the regional level and at the global level have been formed and are now being strengthened. So let us make all these processes very robust. No? So uh, I would like to reiterate the call for a uh, CSO envoy at the United Nations. I am also disappointed, like my colleagues at the campaign for the UN, we need C for UN, that this has been somehow um, part in, in the uh, report of the um, Secretary General. But uh, I think it's very important also that uh, we need to review uh, the engagement of CSOs across all UN agencies because there are some areas in the UN where uh, CSOs are given a lot of time, for example, in Geneva, in, in the processes of the OHCHR, and probably also in the UNEA as shared uh, earlier by Carmen. So let us find uh, where we can start, you know, uh, our participation to be more robust, with, not only within the UN, uh, but also uh, in engaging our own governments. In, in the Philippines, we have always, for the last so many years since the start of all the summits uh, before 1992, before even the UNSED was actually uh, uh, um, agreed upon, uh, we insisted on our own participation with government. So we engaged government in, to the point that uh, they had to include us in our in their delegations. So we have official voices as well. And those spaces that we carve are very important because at this time when COVID has hit us and everything is you know on a downward spiral, I, I think uh, there is no way but up for us. You know, uh, I'm a very optimistic person. And I'd like to reimagine the future, the immediate future where we can actually harness our own power to rebuild at our own locations in our own communities and still bring this uh, uh, experiences uh, and wisdom to the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. Those are some very important points. Our next speaker is Samuel Touré from the Sierra Leone National CSO Coalition. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much. Well, for us uh, in Sierra Leone as a um, civil society here, we actually have some space at some points with the government when it comes to um, BNL engagement, the civil society space, and we have been actively um, participating in coalition with the government. So uh, we have that kind of an inclusive civil society process, which we do. But I want to also highlight some of the challenges that I think um, have been left in us when it comes to our participation um, outside the VNR process. So basically, in one, I think in 2016, we have the government of Sierra Leone made some commitments and the last um, VNR in 2016 to establish some committees where civil society will be able to participate. But unfortunately, that has been a great challenge for civil society um, in Sierra Leone. And the space had actually been left in the vacuum where uh, we can uh, we see our relevance quite more important when it comes to the BNR process. And this has left us with a huge challenge to see, even after the BNR, we're having a greater challenge to see how we follow with 
our um, commitment or kind of challenges that we bring a light to them. So that has actually been one key area, but looking at other participation with regards to developing reports, gathering data, going to the field, it has been a well-coordinated um, work with the government of Sierra Leone. Uh, we're looking at those commitments. We are still looking at a point we are calling on the government to commit to those commitments, like creating the space for civic engagement and, and empower or work with civil society organizations to create more awareness, because we still believe that um, the civil society space is quite a pivotal role in the development process, while we still have a lot of other civil society that have not got the space. For example, we, we have four regions in Sierra Leone, and those regions, we still have a lot of number of civil society that have not been seeing themselves in the front line of engagement. We still have um, a lot of civil society who actually in the first place have not never had the, 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 the platform to engage in the government. So we still lack the, the, the inequality gap and the digital space is a big challenge for civil society. We still have the, the lack of required platform for civil society to engage in civic engagement process. It's still a big challenge for us um, in Sierra Leone. We're looking at um, the, the participation of civil society in key decision-making process with government. That has also been a key challenge for us in Sierra Leone. We still think that uh, the government needs to look into some of these challenges because um, we, we've been kind for too long, but it has not been, we have not been hard at the moment. And we're looking at um, um, the aspect of um, empowering or promoting digital technology um, at the moment, which we think could be of great support. For, for, a, for just a minute, we are out of time, but we have one more speaker. So uh, if, if, if those who are online don't mind, if we could extend by perhaps a maximum of- uh, I can hear you probably please. Minutes, and of course, those who, are, who, who, are, who, can, who have to leave, that's absolutely fine. So uh, apologies for that, uh, for, for that interruption, but Samuel, uh, uh, please go on. Okay, thank you so much. So we are, we are, we, we are civil society ambition, a quiet civic participation, which we want the government to create the platform for civil society to engage and handle issues of quite important that matters to the states. And secondly, we are calling on the civil, the, the government and the United Nations to see how they can create a nurture and enable environment for digital um, um, environment for participation so that civil society can be supported. Another thing again that has been affecting us, our participation is the capacity. Well, in some extent we're there, but the resources it takes to get our work going, it's a big challenge. And the UN itself have not actually been in the full support to see how they come to the aid of the civil society. And they could, they could sometimes link us to the government and then go to the government, we have some limitation. So we are quite constrained, especially when it comes to our participation and digital age. So my suggestion how to the government and the UN is that we are calling on them for them to see how they can nurture a well digital environment where civil society can be able to utilize those platform for civic engagement and to provide enough education to the citizens about civic participation and create a digital environment so that citizens of the country can be able to use and participate. But at the same time, in my closing statement, we still want to remind government from the 2016 Vienna that we are still waiting for their commitment for civil society participation to some committees in terms of decision making so that we can be able to follow up progress and take action where the case may be. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Samuel. And thank, sorry for interrupting you. And, uh, and our last speaker for today is Malin Benson Lawrence, who's the youth delegate from Denmark. Malin, I'm sorry for, for the delay in coming to you, and, um, and uh, my apologies for that, but the floor is yours now. <laughs> no worries, and thank you for the word. Uh, and thank you for this uh, great and interesting talk today. Let me just start out by acknowledging Kathleen, who I uh, wanted to speak up before. <laughs> it's so awesome to see that some, someone is so passionate that you just have to uh, talk about what is important to you. So unfortunately, uh, the schedule today is a little bit tight and I'll try to uh, be quick. Um, as a youth delegate to the UN, I will be talking mostly about uh, inclusion of young people, but I believe many of the issues and solutions are quite related. Um, the biggest problem I have found uh, as a youth delegate has been the fact that, um, or, or just in general for young people to be involved, is that the UN system is 
beyond complex. So to take part uh, in the, at the UN, even if you have an invitation to do so, it requires an immense amount of resources. And having been a youth delegate for two years now, there's still so many things that I'm only just learning or still have to learn. And uh, if we're being real, most young people, and I think even most civil society organizations do not have that kind of time or resources to figure out a system and even less so to uh, actually figure out how to do advocacy at uh, that level. So to me, this is an indicator that either the participation channels have to be simplified or the UN and member states will have to be the ones to reduce the complexity for us and to be more proactive in inviting us into more contexts. One way uh, would be at least for the UN to do this is to include civil society and young people in meetings during the planning of forums and meetings. I believe the unmute campaign is a result of not being asked how inclusion is meaningful to uh, civil society. And my my colleagues, colleagues and I shouldn't have to spend our time after each forum um, to send in comments and suggestions of improvement that could have been included in the event that we just spent days or even sometimes weeks, weeks of our uh, volunteer time to take part in. Another thing is that the amount of real dialogue during UN meetings, I think we all know, <laughs> are quite limited. And as the in-between of the meetings and the chances of networking has disappeared with COVID, it has become increasingly it has become increasingly difficult for us to actually have an impact or even to simply connect with someone. Um, so uh, I really want to encourage us all to plan meetings really prioritizing interaction and real dialogue, as well as planning meetings focused specifically on networking. My last point, uh, I also just want to point out the, what has already been mentioned also by the Unmute campaign is to utilize national and regional UN offices in order to combat technological inequalities uh, in taking part. And as long as we don't do that, I don't believe we will have a broad and inclusive uh, um, engagement of young people or civil society. So finishing off, I simply want to stress uh, that we need to move our focus away from the number of participants onto focusing on the number of young voices heard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valine, for those excellent points. And uh, uh, it's, it's my uh, duty now to, to do a wrap up. But uh, first of all, I want to thank all the delegates who came here physically uh, to our offices. Uh, of the Baha'i international community. And Dan, thank you very much, the Baha'i international community, for being the gracious host. The, my last uh, uh, order of business for today is to give the floor to Ollie Henman from Action for Sustainable Development, who has played in, uh, a key role in the organization of this event. Oh, thank you so much, Mandeep. It's very kind of you to, to give the time. I know that we are very, very limited. and. I just wanna quickly respond to some of the things that we've seen in the chat. And thank you so much to everyone who's been able to join today. We know that it's not perfect doing things uh, in this format. And I know there's a lot of questions in the chat asking for more time uh, for us to be able to hear more voices. And we recognize that we are all learning and developing ways to try to capture those views as broadly as we can. As we mentioned earlier, we have had the Slido poll open and that will stay open for another week. And so that's another way to gather views. We know that we've had uh, approximately 200 people on the call today, which is a great sign to see how so many civil society colleagues from all around the world uh, really do care strongly about these key issues. And we really recognize the uh, support that we've seen from key governments uh, from Denmark, from Costa Rica, from Mexico, from Finland, and from many others who signed the, those recommendations. Um, and from the Action for Sustainable Development side, I'd also like to thank all of our colleagues across the civil society networks that have already been mentioned. And we really look forward to continuing to work with you to keep up the pressure now as part of the next steps at the UN. Thank you. Thanks everyone watching online. Thank you, we'll see you soon and we'll send a follow-up email straight after this. Thank you. Um, is, is there going to be um, enough time for me to speak now, please? Um, I'm, I'm, my name is Kathleen uh, Vachel. Um, I'm extremely new to this. I've, I've never done anything like this ever before. 
Um, and You're very welcome, Kathleen. If you have a very, very short point, I think I right. must admit well, that I, our, I, interpreters, I, 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 yes, our interpreters are likely to drop. Oh, this is Edward from Can I come in briefly? Just one second. Let's hear Kathleen. And Thank I know you. that the people in the room have to leave and our interpreters have to leave, but I'm very happy to stay online for another few more minutes. Uh, yes. Kathleen, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, I, I, yeah. I'd just like to say that um, I think the elite minority have uh, made the world um, into such a damn mess now. And um, we the world is in such a massive crisis that um, the world leaders and big business and so on uh, really need to listen to uh, a much more diverse and inclusive um, number of people, um, including civil society groups and organizations and members, and uh, in order to change the world and make it a fairer and better place for everyone and all animals and you know, for for the whole of the environment, um, and um, I am uh, I am happy to help. Um, I have been uh, really disillusioned and disappointed and disengaged with politics. Um, um, I'm, I, I've I've been sick to death of it, quite frankly, and um, I'm sixty years old now, and I've had. I have had many, many uh, difficult circumstances in my life. Um, and also um, I've been, on, hang on, I've been on a journey recently and periodically during the past two decades. And I have been learning um, about human rights and social issues as, as, as well as having a lot of life experience of many difficulties thank but you thank you, thank you for your interest yes. in Ole, me thank you so much <laughs> and it's i mean welcome to to this uh, gathering and to future network meetings like this um, i think that's exactly the kind those are some of the kinds of issues that many people on this call are grappling with in so many different countries and so many different contexts uh, it's always a challenge for us uh, within an hour to try to have every voice heard. But just to reassure people again, I see the questions in the chat. The Slido is still open and we'll make sure to gather all those views for the uh, coming week. We'll also make sure to send a follow up email with links to the video recordings for those who would like to watch the video again. We'll make sure that we gather all the views through the Slido and we will be sharing those directly with the ministers who you heard speaking today. We've had assurances from the various uh, embassies that they would welcome those views. Um, and as we know, there will be further follow up discussions with the governments that you've heard from today. So. Uh, this is not the end of the conversation. Uh, don't feel that you have to have your voice today, um, but we really welcome all of your inputs. Um, and please continue to send those you know, through the Slido or by email. Uh, you can respond also to the email that you would have received when you registered for uh, the event, and that way you'll get uh, back in touch with us as the organizers. So I think uh, I think we really do need to close now, I'm afraid, because I, I believe that the, the Zoom link needs to be used for another meeting. So. Thank you to everyone once more. Uh, Dan, do you want to say anything more before we close? Okay, thank, thank you, you again. Thank you. See you guys next time. Great. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you, Oli. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Oli. Thank you, my friends. Bye-bye.